Hi there guys. Right, this is going to be my first attempt at trying to teach you about overtaking. I'm going to try and emulate like while sitting in the car um, doing these things. So let's crack on with it. Right, overtaking, probably the most dodgy thing you can do in a car. So be careful, right? If in doubt, chicken out. You want to make sure it's all nice and safe before you do anything. Um, so make sure you check, all right? Now, we have a look at this diagram here. You've basically got your lorry, the car going for the overtake. Do take into account that the lorry is actually going to be moving up. And so therefore you have to take a long angle to get back in. Never cut back in front of a vehicle. Um, basically, a vehicle as it's driving down the road needs a certain amount of room in order to stop. So if you're coming down the road and you pull in front of a vehicle and then suddenly you have to stop, this lorry is going to take a long time to stop and he will have to use you as a brake pedal basically and he's going to squash you flat. All right. You get this a lot, for instance, as an example, um, on the A331 heading towards the Hog's Back. I see this in the morning. So people are called coming down in the right hand lane and they will barrel into the left hand lane and if there's a lorry there they will just pull straight in front of him uh, but if he has to stop suddenly or, or the traffic comes to a stop and they stop in front of him he's got nowhere to go he's just going to squash you all right never ever cut back in front of a large vehicle or even any other car you always want to give them room so if you're actually overtaking best thing to do especially like if you're on dual carriageway as you go past you wait until you can see one of their headlights in your rear view mirror and then that's a nice time to go back all right um but pff, never cut in front it's you are asking for trouble all right now when you're following a vehicle i don't know if you can see that all right there we go so over here with these ones Never follow a vehicle closely because it really obscures your view. So we're right up behind this lorry here and we can't see what's coming up. Whereas if we stay back, we can see whether or not there's any junctions coming up, any road signs, changing speed limits, cars coming, all that sort of stuff. Okay, so just keep an eye to see what is coming up the road and stay back. Um, I remember one on one of the driving tests, actually, that a student was uh, just driving along and the examiner asked her to take the next road on the left. Uh, and as she was coming up to it, the um, she, well, she was basically following a van way too closely and uh, she just drove straight past the junction. So she got marked down for following distance because she was driving so close that you can't see anything that's coming up. So it's not so bad if you're following a car, I suppose, because you could look through the car. But if you're following a van, then don't go there. All right. So what about gear consideration? Right, now, the longer you spend in the path of oncoming vehicles, the more danger you are in. And therefore, what we want to do is get past uh, those vehicles as fast as we can. Now, 
The way to get past a vehicle is to have a big differential in speed between you and the speed of the vehicle that you're overtaking. Therefore, we need to build speed real quick. Now, this therefore means that you are probably going to have to go down a gear or two maybe to kick your revs up. Remember that revs equals power. In an automatic, you use kick down, which is where you just slap your foot to the floor. The engine goes down a few gears. Sorry, the gearbox goes down a few gears, which raises the revs on the engine. This gives you power. You therefore accelerate past the car super fast. Obviously, in a manual, you would just go down the gears. Now, a lot of people think that you go up a gear. Now, it is true that a higher gear gives you access to higher speeds, but it takes a lot longer to build speed. And if all we want to do is quickly build five or ten miles an hour, then going down a gear will give you that extra power that you need to quickly build and go around. We're going to go for the overtake and we're going to go past. Now, one of the first jobs that I had was dealing with motor accidents, and it's actually a very common accident for this car to do a lane change as they are being overtaken themselves and subsequently push a car that is overtaken them down into a ditch. All right, so it's really important that you check. Um, always check those mirrors, find out what's going on, come out, look long, see what's going on, then you can go for it. All right, if we use my trusty police driver's essential handbook and I go to my overtaking page which I did have but then managed to shut what you do is you use overtaking triangles hmm, an overtaking triangle right now when you get a really good view of the road ahead then of course you can take a run up and then go past and back in. In the absence of a good view ahead, then what you want to be doing is staying behind the vehicle you're overtaking, but you basically sit on their shoulder and then come out and go back in. So I'm now sitting behind a car, I'm gonna go for an overtake like that, all right? So, I'm sitting on here and I need to be able to come out, check to see if anyone's coming and go back in, but I need to be able to get back in behind a car. What a lot of people do is they go for the overtake like that and then a car turns and they have to brake to drop back in. But you always just need that backup to get back out of the way, all right? So it's come across, have a look, then go back in, come out, look at that, and then go poof, like that, all right? That's what we're looking for. But always make sure that you're not being overtaken and get the gear prepped. So I would actually get that gear change done prior to coming out. So I might be driving along behind a car in fifth gear out in the countryside, for instance, chalk it down to third maybe, up come the revs, then I can start coming out, having a look to see if it's safe coming in, checking there's no one coming up behind me, and then go out and go for it, right? Now, this is all well and good if you've got a decent engine, okay? So like when I did my advanced driving and they demonstrated this, the bloke had a BMW M5, you know, like 500 horsepower, uh, and coming out and then just accelerating was not a problem. If you've got your one litre micro, this might be a bit of an issue. Um, and I certainly found it when I was growing up, 17, all that sort of stuff. So I'd want to do this, uh, but wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. So what I found was doing a little bit of a combination. So you want to sort of stay back a bit, but you've got to build your speed. And if you haven't got a a powerful car it's going to be really difficult and this is where you've got to learn what your car does and then just decide well it's just not worth it you know unless you've got a really good view you only live once it's a shame to finish it today all right um it's really dodgy overtaking so you've got to learn what your car does get it ready prime it and go for it if when you were going for an overtake the car suddenly appears in the distance you might want to keep your foot in because if you're already going past the car, you've got to get in. But, you know, if it's if you don't think you've got enough room to get around and back in safely, then you should not be overtaking. I can't stress that enough. Just don't do it. All right. 
Uh, but, you know, as we're saying, if you get a good view, by all means, take a long run up, go around. Um, that's absolutely fine. Let's talk about places that are bad to overtake. Right. Not exhaustive, but we have a loss, a lot of different options here. Okay, so first of all, we've got pedestrian crossings. Um, I mean, that's officially zebra crossing, isn't it? But they use it interchangeably with pedestrian crossings. Well, people are walking in the road, aren't they? Um, so it's not a good idea to overtake on the approach to a pedestrian crossing because people are in it, all right? Uh, you just don't overtake. So if you're ever warned of something, just don't do it. This one. Right, so this is a railway track with no gate or barrier. So you might have warning lights going ding dong, ding dong, that sort of thing. Uh, or you might sometimes get that across farmland. Um, let's say you were going to a camping site or something. Dodgy as hell. Um, but if you just think about railway tracks generally, they are often raised. Right, so you can come up to them and you can't really see what's on the other side. So, and it's raised, so you're basically taking it a ramp. It's like a, basically a jump. I would not be building speed to go over something where I can't see if there's anything coming the other side. Um, that could get really, really messy, especially if you don't know if there's a train coming. So um, it's got danger written all over it. I just don't do it. Right. Staggered crossroad. That's what that one is. Um, so basically, you've got turnings on your left and your right. Um, of course, anything can happen at a junction. Here we have a lot of different scenarios that could occur. Um, cars coming in, going out, the vehicle you're overtaking might turn in, a vehicle that you can't see might pull out. Um, oh, pff. again, don't do it. Cyclists have a habit of just suddenly swinging across the road. So if you are coming up to a situation where you can't really see, then, you know, ugh. Just wait, just go past the junction, make sure it's safe and then go for it. Obviously making sure you aren't being overtaken yourself, all right? This one. Steep incline, so we're going uphill. 20%, so that's basically one in five. This could be useful, you never know. So I used to do a load of driving around on the M25. So I used to work down in Stevenage and work in Farnborough, or live in Farnborough, sorry. And uh, there's a big section on the M25, it's about two miles long, and it's really steep. And so what used to happen was, uh, I, my car had cruise control, so I'm just driving along the road and the car just keeps it at 70 miles an hour. Right, so, you go like this. so I'd probably be behind a car, just following it. And then what would happen is, as I got to the hill, that car would start to go up but they would start to slow down because they're manually driving or something. And then all I do is just lane change and then you just sail past them and then come back in again. So it actually can be useful. It could be like you get lorries on a hill. Um, you sometimes get what's known as a crawler lane. And that is the left-hand lane uh, for slow moving vehicles. Get this a lot down in the countryside, Devon, Dorset, that sort of thing. Steep hills left-hand lane for a long time, maybe on a mountainous area, and the vehicle is just getting slower and slower. You've got caravans, lorries, all that sort of stuff. Now, anyone can use the left-hand lane, but you get to a steep environment, they are likely to slow down. 
So even though you can't really accelerate because maybe your car isn't powerful enough, then um, you still can just sail straight past them. So it can be an advantage. At the end of the day, we want that differential, changes in speeds. Uh, as long as we get it, does it really matter if we build it or they lose it? It's still a differential. Just make sure again that you aren't being overtaken when you go for an overtake. Humpback Bridge. All right. Uh, now, the thing about Humpback Bridge is they are quite high. Originally, they were for horse and cart going over like a, a stream or something, so you or a canal. So you'd have like barges with coal on and things like that going over. Now, because they were built for horse and cart, they're often quite narrow. So they're not wide enough for two cars. Additionally, they are very steep. Um, and so they're often higher than your window. So therefore, you can't see what's on the other side. Um, so not only are you going to narrow down to one lane, but it also goes up. Now, flashback to when I was 17 and stupid. You've got to bear in mind, right, that this was back in the 90s. And on the television, you used to get loads of stuff like Starsky and Hutch, the A-Team, stuff like that. And there were loads of programmes on TV where cars would fly through the air. I suppose Ken Block doing his Hoonigan stuff now and he's just jumping over stuff. Uh, well, that was all over the TV, right? So, because I was 17 and stupid, I thought I would see if a car flies by going through a humpback bridge, right? And I can confirm they do not. What actually happens is you've got your bridge like this, just so you know, and this is for these, these stupid 17 year old boys because it's boys that do this, isn't it? So you've got a bridge like that. Car comes along like this and the suspension compresses on the front and the front of your car smashes into the bridge. And then it goes up in the air like this and then you hit your head on the ceiling and then it comes down on the nose because of course the engine's at the front so your nose heavy and you go smack into the floor and all your light bulbs come flying out of the dashboard and you bend the whole front of your car and you drive home at night time with no headlights and a broken dashboard. Okay, now that's what happens. Uh, you can thank me later. I've taken one for the team. You're welcome. <laughs> I did a lot of stupid stuff when I was 17. Uh, but I've done that so that you don't have to. At the time, I thought that was a very stupid thing to do. But with hindsight, I'm now thinking... I'm doing that for you, so that you don't have to, all right? So, proof, don't use them as jumps. Uh, right, next. Exclamation mark. Right, now, the exclamation mark basically means danger. Now, it could be anything. You don't know what. This particular one is a hidden dip in this book. But it could be anything, it could be flood, falling rocks, whatever. Right. Out of interest, a hidden dip is where the lay of the land is really, um, it's like the road just follows the lay of the land, right? So it's not like a bump in the road or anything. So you're driving along the top here, and then you go down into a hollow, but nobody over here can see that you're in the hollow. So they go for the overtake and then you come out and you meet a car on the wrong side of the road. So now think of it like at night time, right? So at night time, all you've got is a black road and you've got cat's eyes reflecting light at you. So as you look up the road, you're thinking, well, there's nothing coming. Unbeknownst to you, there's actually a dip in the road and there could be a lorry in that hole. I mean, they're big. Big holes. You go for the overtake into the path of oncoming traffic and then suddenly something comes out the floor in front of you. Um, well, <laughs> that's a good excuse to change your underwear, I can tell you. So uh, be careful on hidden dips, all right? Often they go and put the solid white line in the middle of the road to say no overtaking. Uh, which we'll come to. Uh, but oh, dodgy, 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 dodgy. Zigzags or double bends. That could be flipped the other way around. So you could be going left or right and then right and left. And they'll often say double bends for half a mile or something. 
Well, obviously, logically, if you're coming up to a corner, there could be a car around the corner, so don't approach on the wrong side of the road. You'd have to be mad, like I was when I was 17. This road narrows, OK? Uh, so for this particular one, the lane on the my side of the road, on the left, is moving over to the right. It could be flipped the other way, so it could be that they are coming into yours. And you will often get this uh, accompanied by the roadwork sign. So if the council are digging up the road or the gas board or whatever, uh, they'll put this up there. It could be that there's an overhang, like for instance in Wokingham, there's... Um, We've got old buildings and basically the upstairs sticks out further than the downstairs does so people tend to walk under bedrooms and stuff but if you had a lorry you could then easily take somebody's bedroom out because it's right next to the road uh, so it says high vehicles next to it as well to warn them that there's something there so wide into narrow like that not to be confused with the tuning fork where you have two that merge and make one. The lines are subtly thicker, but that is the end of dual carriageway. So the lines are thicker to signify uh, like carriageways, whereas these ones are narrow to signify lanes. Unfortunately, though, unless you've got one right next to the other, you won't recognise that they're different thicknesses. So you'll just have to notice that the tuning fork is an end of dual carriageway and the rest of them are all lanes related. Circles are orders. They prohibit you from doing something. So this particular one means no overtaking. You will often get on there, it'll say, for 350 yards, for instance. I think there's one in Upper Hale, right? Um, so you've got... That saying no overtaking for 350 yards. You should have solid white lines in the middle of the road, meaning no overtaking as well. But in Upper Hale, they've got a broken white line. So the white line says you can overtake, but this says you can't. I would work on the basis that if one of them says you can't, you don't. Uh, that way you don't have to argue the case in court. Because that's just a bit weird, isn't it? Right, dual carriageway ahead. Stunningly means there is a dual carriageway ahead. But it also means that you are in a single carriageway. Right, now, remember, the definition of a dual carriageway is dual carriageways. A carriageway is a strip of tarmac. Not number of lanes, right? The strip of tarmac could have any number of lanes on them, one, seven, whatever, doesn't matter. Most people think a dual carriageway means two lanes, doesn't, it means two strips of tarmac. So if you are separated from oncoming traffic and both of you are on your own separate piece of tarmac, that's a dual carriageway. So it could be that you've got a grass verge in the middle or a crash barrier, a raised bit, row of trees, whatever, but basically, if the only thing separating you from oncoming traffic is paint, then you are on a single carriageway because there's only one strip of tarmac. As soon as you get grass, crash barriers, curbs, anything, there are two strips of tarmac and that's a dual carriageway. So let's say you're out in the countryside, you're stuck behind a lorry or on a tractor or something, and you're thinking you're going around and trying to get back in and out. You see that road sign that says dual carriageway coming up. Chances are, but not guaranteed, but chances are you will probably have multiple lanes, which gives you a good opportunity to go for an overtake. So just relax. That's what basically it means. Uh, just chill out, all right? You're gonna have an overtaking opportunity coming up, so stop trying to risk your life now. It's probably gonna say half a mile. Well, your average speed at 60 miles an hour is one mile a minute, so you're only 30 seconds away from an overtaking opportunity. Just a word of, uh, you know, just give you the heads up. All the people behind you are gagging to go for an overtake themselves because they've also been stuck behind this tractor. So what you've got to make sure is as soon as the road gets wider and you are able to get round, you seize that opportunity. 
Okay, so you want to stay back a bit, just like we said earlier, never follow something close. Stay back a bit so you can start to see whether or not it breaks into a wide lane and then take a run up and pounce as soon as it gets wide because everybody else behind you will do the same thing. All right, and if you don't do it immediately, you'll get stuck. Everyone will come past you and it'll go back to a single and you're still stuck behind the tractor. So pounce. Pedestrian crossings. Now we've got zigzags on the floor. What? <laughs> The highway code states you are not allowed to overtake the vehicle that is nearest to the crossing. Now, if you look at that, you're thinking, well, why would you overtake anyway? You'd be a blooming idiot. But don't forget, there are often different types of um, crossings like this. If you think about Farnborough in the high street near McDonald's at the Tumble Down Dick, we've actually got an urban dual carriageway there, right? So you've got two lanes that go that way and two lanes that come the other way. So if you've got two lanes, now if we think about it, you could have cars queuing on the approach you are allowed to go past, but you're not allowed to overtake the vehicle that is nearest to the crossing until you've had a chance to make sure that the crossing is clear. Because presumably, somebody is stationary at the crossing because there's a pedestrian on it. So, you know, just logic. But obviously you're allowed to overtake all the cars leading up to the one at the front of the queue. White lines. Hmm, here's an interesting thing. They come in different uh, lengths and separations, right? And I would like you to think of them like a row of bricks. So the more bricks there are in the middle of the road, the less they want you to overtake uh, without hitting a brick. Um, and so you should be wary. So when you get solid white lines down the middle of the road, it's the equivalent of having a brick wall. They do not want you to get to the other side. But the more spaced out the white lines are, the bigger the gaps between the bricks, and therefore the easier it is for you to get to the other side of the road without hitting a brick. Therefore, the happier they are to let you overtake. Now, here we have lots of different white lines. You get a hazard line. which is this one. So this is where you get the gap is smaller than the lines. And again, the longer the line, the more hazardous the upcoming road is. So maybe you're coming approaching a, uh, like a field um, where tractors could be coming out in the countryside. And you also get cat size between every white line. Then you get a lane divider or centre white line. And this is where the white line is shorter than the gap and cat signs are every two white lines. All right. Um, and again, the more spaced out they are, like on motorways, you get little teeny weeny white lines with massive gaps between because it's you're free to overtake whenever you like. When you get up to double solid white lines, then that means that the white line that is nearest to you is the one that you abide by. So in this instance, traffic traveling in either direction is not allowed to overtake. In this instance,
Traffic travelling that way is not allowed to overtake, but traffic coming that way is allowed to overtake. When we go this way, they are allowed to overtake, but traffic coming this way is not allowed to overtake. All right, so it's the white line that's nearest to you, and the length of the line signifies how dangerous the upcoming road is. Okay, now, in all instances, you can get fat versions of the white line. So for instance, like this one. So this is the equivalent of this one, but it's fat, just like in here, if I do it that way, this is a fat version of that. All right? Now, they go and put these fat ones up, uh, often in corners out in the countryside, and it's often where there has been a head-on collision, like two lorries have clipped each other, what people tend to do, if they're taking a right-hand corner, for instance, they tend to fall to the inside of the corner. But if somebody's coming the other way, then we run the risk of meeting in the corner, going plonk, like that, right? So they make the central white line wider to separate people to avoid the collision. Therefore, even when you get this type, which says you can overtake, the reason they've made it fat is because someone has hit another car there. So unless you are actually overtaking, then stay out of the white hatched area, right? There's, there's no point in being in there. It's there for a reason. It's to keep you safe. So stay in your lane. Do not fall through that central bit, although technically you're allowed in there. It defeats the whole point of having it, right? Now, I don't know if you can see that. You can if I hide it myself. Right, so normally you get white lines on the... Sorry, that's, a, that's an arrow, isn't it? It's an arrow. So you normally get two white arrows on the approach to a solid white line saying get back um yeah because it's saying stop overtaking get back to the left because you are approaching a solid white line and then you would get a solid white line on the approach to a corner because you're coming up to something dangerous but you'll see here that People who have been through the corner and are coming out the other side are now getting spaced out white lines. And that's because they've done the danger. Uh, presumably, there's no future danger ahead of them, so they're released. So if you're always coming into something dodgy, then you would get a solid white line. But if you've been through the something dodgy and you're coming out, then it will often get spaced out. Unless, of course, you're coming up to another dodgy thing. All right. Now, I do want to highlight to you that this is not to be confused with these. All right. Now, these things are turning areas on the approach to a junction and you've got to have a sense of scale what i was just talking about with thick lines in the middle of the road uh, that's just to separate traffic and it's often that that turning area is or those hatched areas are not wide enough to put a whole car in but these ones are right now notice this one has a broken white line around the outside this one does not just like these do not have broken white lines around the outside. So just like the white lines I've shown you, if you have a broken white line, you are allowed to go through there. The highway code states you should not, which is only a recommendation, remember, should not, unless it is necessary and safe to do so. Solid white lines, they say you must not unless in an emergency. Now, I'm thinking the only thing I can think of emergency wise is if you need to get to hospital because somebody's uh, is blood related coming on. So something like we're squirting blood everywhere. You've lost an arm or maybe maybe someone is just about to make a new person. 
that might be a good excuse to get to hospital quickly. Um, and that could be classed as an emergency, but you know, I'll leave that to the police to decide, not me. All right, but that's the only thing I can think of. Remember, if an emergency vehicle turns up, they are allowed to go in there, you aren't. So you're still not allowed to break the law to help an emergency vehicle because they are the ones that have got the special dispensation to drive in all of these areas, all right? So I heartily recommend, and I do it all the time, if I was gonna come up to here, yes, you could do that, but sometimes, depends upon how big this area is, you might find that you've come in and you've left your bum sticking out and blocking this road a little bit. Depends on how big this bit is, this bit, all right? So it can be useful to come through here. And if you had a lot of cars, you might actually queue in there. Oops, you might queue in uh, that can't be it, there. You might queue like that, all right? But this one, you are not allowed to queue in there. So you would actually have to queue in the road and in like that, you, okay? You're not allowed in this bit. It's very weird doing everything backwards. All right, <laughs> or mirrored, should I say. Right now, the reason this one, this one here, has got a solid white line on it, is because sometimes, like there's one, there's one outside fleet where it's a fifty mile an hour road. It's really busy, uh, and a lot of people, because this bit here out there has got a broken white line around it, people are allowed to stop in it. So what they do is they do halfway. So they come out and then sit here to wait until traffic stops coming out and then they join traffic. But in this particular example, you wouldn't be allowed to do that. All right. So yeah, feel free to go through these. And remember the rule is you should not go in there unless it's safe and necessary to do so. You are the driver. It is therefore up to you to decide if it is necessary. Ta-da! I just want to highlight, if I go back to my trusty solid white line, here we go. Uh, there. Uh, if I was, we'll go that way. If they say there's a side road here, um, you are not allowed to stop in it. You would have to stop next to it and then turn. Whereas the other ones you just saw a minute ago, you could get into that bit. But again, it's a sense of scale. When are you allowed to cross a solid white line? Well, I'll tell you, you are allowed to cross a solid white line when turning into a side road or um, driveway, that sort of thing, to cross, or sorry, go around a parked vehicle, obviously. Although, interestingly, if you have double white lines in the middle of the road, you're not allowed to park on a road which has got solid white lines in the middle of the road. So I can only assume that they must have broken down. So you're allowed to go around a broken down car because they're not allowed to actually park there. So you can go around a parked car. You are also allowed to go around a horse, cyclist or road maintenance vehicle, which uh, if they're traveling at 10 mile an hour or less. When we say road maintenance vehicle, we're talking one of those little machines with the beta bars, you know, that keeps vacuum cleaners that goes around sucking up the road, that sort of thing, with the flashing amber light on the top. Now, when you read the highway code, it is worded that you are not allowed to overtake a horse, cyclist, or road maintenance vehicle traveling at 10 miles an hour or less. Now I've had this argument with examiners before and they, or the ones that I was chatting with, were of the opinion that it is only the road maintenance vehicle traveling at 10 mile an hour, which is the important bit. However, I have had a dig around and found the technical document behind the scenes and it expressly states a cyclist traveling at 10 mile an hour or less, horse traveling at 10 mile an hour or less, road maintenance vehicle traveling at 10 mile an hour or less, okay?
So technically, if there was a bicycle traveling at 11 miles an hour, you're not allowed to overtake them. However, having said that, clearly the examiners don't really care uh, and no policeman is going to try and enforce that. So that's probably why everybody overtakes cyclists and doesn't get told off for it. Uh, but if you're on your driving test, should you? Mm, I'll leave that with you. You can make that decision. I'm not saying you should or should not. All right. All I would suggest is if you are going to do it, try to keep um, the amount of car that you cross the line to a minimum. All right. Now, I suppose food for thought. You are approaching something dodgy, like uh, a crest of a hill. You've got solid white lines down the middle of the road. Clearly, they don't want us to overtake. But let's say it's a fast road, like 50. Coming out of Aldershot, for instance, heading back towards Farnborough, is a 50 mile an hour road. And there's a bit of a crest that we're coming up to. And so therefore, they go and put solid white lines in the middle of the road so that we don't overtake on the approach to a blind crest because something could come over the top. Now, if I was following a bicycle, of course, he's travelling at, say, 15 miles an hour. So he could be, if we're at the beginning of the solid white line, we're still actually quite a long way away from the thing that they're telling you is dangerous. So there could well be time to safely get around the bike and back in before you get near the crest. But if you are getting near to the thing that they are warning you about, I would not be overtaking. Wait until you're on the other side and then go for the overtake, all right? And I think it's probably going to be that sort of thing that the examiners are looking for. If you're a long way away from the danger, then they don't mind it. But, you know, <laughs> I'm sure a driving examiner will um, contact me about this at some point and go, <gasps> oh, blasphemy, encouraging people to overtake. Um, but pff, I'm not encouraging it. I'm just saying these are the considerations you've got to have. The choice is yours. If you want to risk it, carry on. But I'm not saying you should or should not. All right. I'm washing my hands of the whole sordid affair. Lane changing. Right. So going for an overtake. Again, obviously, make sure that you are not being overtaken when you go for an overtake. But if you've got cars on your shoulder, the best way to overtake is get your foot down. If you're going into a new lane faster than the vehicles that are behind you, they physically cannot catch you and they, therefore they cannot hit you. So as long as you realise that no one's coming past you, your best bet is to accelerate. Lots of learners just pull into the path of a car, travel slowly and then all hell lets loose and horns are beeping and all sorts of stuff. Just get on with it. You're doing a lane change, outrun the car that you're going in front of, problem solved. Just don't break the speed limit whilst you're doing it, all right? Passing on the left. Right, there are three instances of when you can pass on the left. So let's say you've got two lanes. For instance, coming off Queen's Roundabout, heading down to the test centre in Farnborough, you've got a little dual carriageway heading into the industrial estate. Often you will get learners coming off the roundabout and heading down in the right hand lane uh, because they're going to turn right at the bottom of the hill and they turn right and go around the tree and come back out again. But they don't put their right indicator on for a while. Now, the highway code states that you can overtake or pass on the left when the vehicle in the right hand lane puts their right indicator on, when you are in a one way street or if you are in built up traffic and the left hand lane is traveling faster than the right one. So, for instance, a traffic jam on the motorway, OK? Your one-way street, if you think about that, I don't know if you know Basingstoke at all, but they've got a uh, dual carriageway that goes right round. So it's a ring road that goes right round the town centre. And you've got little islands in the middle, pedestrian safety havens, where pedestrians stand midway, that sort of thing. You've got keep left and right signs that go either side of the island. Depending on which lane you're in, you'll either go continuing round or you might peel off to the left or the right. 
And if your particular lane happens to be traveling fast, then you may pass in a one way street. OK. Heading down towards the test center in Fabra, one of my students did fail once because he decided to pass on the left because there was a learner in the right hand lane who was ultimately going to turn right at the tree. But he didn't wait long enough to wait for that right indicator to come on and therefore he's passed on the left. The examiner then failed him because he has gone against the highway code. It's a safety issue. Now, whether or not you think that's a bit harsh or not, it's up to you. But if we think about it, by default, everybody is supposed to drive on the left. Uh, to drive in the right hand lane with no indicator on monopolizes two lanes because technically against the highway code, you're not allowed to use the left hand lane to pass and you are physically in the right hand lane. Uh, so therefore people can't pass you there because you're in the lane. So therefore you are monopolizing two lanes. Right now, this is um, inconsiderate driving. So if you are Got, or if you've got somebody in the right hand lane and you are trying to pass them on the left, that person in the right lane is supposed to come back to the left and you're going to drive into their blind spot. Therefore, you're increasing the chance of them trying to wipe you out. Therefore, you don't do it. As soon as they put that right indicator on, of course, they have confirmed that they're going to the right and therefore it's free to go down the left. So it's just a safety issue. Whilst, I suppose, whilst we're on that topic, let's say you're on the motorway and you get middle lane hoggers. Right. Now, this is, I think it's number three on the list of people that things that people hate the most about driving. But passing on the left, let's clarify that. That is only a recommendation. That we don't do it. And from a driving test point of view, an examiner is checking to make sure you're not breaking any laws, but also that you're complying with the highway code. And if the highway code says you shouldn't do something, then you shouldn't do it. Simple as that, right? Because that's a safety issue. And that's what the examiner is primarily concerned with. The police, however, are only concerned with um, laws, basically. Now, there is Section 3 of the Road Traffic Act 1988, which states that it is inconsiderate driving, driving in an aggressive manner, speeding, basically driving like a boy racer uh, is illegal. So if you were on a motorway, having passed your driving test and you found a vehicle just doing 60 miles an hour in the middle lane and you were in the left hand lane doing everything you should because that's where we drive by default and you're just cruising along at 70. If you choose to pass them on the left, you're going against a recommendation, but you're not actually breaking a law. However, the person driving in an inconsiderate manner in the middle of the motorway is breaking the law because they're falling under Section 3 of the Road Traffic Act. Uh, so the police, faced with you passing on the left and them middle lane hogging, they are going to pull the middle lane hogger because you're only breaking a recommendation, whereas they are breaking the law. However, if you start weaving in and out, overtaking on the right, then the left and over the right and scooting through, now you are driving in an aggressive manner. And that also falls under Section 3 of the Road Traffic Act. And so they will pull you and give you a stern telling off and possibly points. All right. So if you're just staying in the left hand lane, the police will let you get away with it. But a driving examiner will not. Just so you know, just so you have the full picture. Animals, dodgy as hell. And I want to get this under control, right? I'll clarify this for you. Quash, a common misconception. Right, so let's take a horse, for instance, right? Now, I don't know if you know, but I have two. Right, so my wife rides, 
Um, I can't see the point in them myself, but I've got them anyway. Most of the animals that you see, like a horse, or maybe a farmer is moving cattle around, or sheep, or something like that, uh, they're going to be herbivores, and they are the bottom of the food chain. Any animal that is at the bottom of the food chain, their first reaction to something scary is run away from it and then come back to investigate to see what the problem was. Right, now, most people think that when they're driving their car, the problem with meeting a horse is that the horse is scared of the car. And that is a common misconception and that's where the problem lies. Now, my horse, when I go to go and visit him, he hears me coming down the road and he sees me putting into the gateway. And when I pull into the gateway, all of them are standing at the fence looking at me, going, ooh, carrots, lovely, happy times, cuddles. Right. And they've heard me come from miles away. I mean, a horse has got massive ears. He can hear me from miles away. So they know there's a car coming. And when we're out riding, my wife will be on the horse. I'll be on my bike because I don't ride a horse. Uh, and we can tell that there's a car coming because his ears go boom, and he just tunes in to the car that's coming behind. And we know a good 30 seconds, a minute before the car turns up that there is a car coming. Coupled with the fact that the horse is not scared of cars, he knows it's coming, the, the car itself does not cause any problems. However, anything new or sudden or surprising that occurs will spook the horse. And we don't know what's just round the corner. So, officially, according to the Royal Horse Association, horses, anyway, the RH, something, anyway, something to do with horses, the recommendation is that you should have a two metre gap away from the horse, travelling no more than 15 miles an hour when you pass them. And the reason is this, a horse, don't know if you know this, but a horse, when startled, will jump sideways at a speed of about 55 miles an hour, or can do. Granted, they don't go very far, but they just jump sideways suddenly. If you're coming past a horse and a horse suddenly goes boom in front of you, you've got up to three quarters of a tonne of meat coming through your windscreen with metal feet uh, and crushing you and killing the driver probably paralysing the rider, probably damaging the horse completely, you might have to get it destroyed, all the rest of it. It gets very messy, very horrible, lots of blood, lots of guts, lots of written off cars. And there is the problem. Because you aren't the scary thing, a horse spooks at everything. I mean, they're even frightened of puddles, for God's sake. So, They'll be riding along the road. Suddenly, a dangerous pigeon flies out from a bush, or maybe a dangerous packet of quavers blows across the road. Or maybe there's a bloke in the field next to us shooting rabbits and a gun goes off, or there's a bird scarer going, or something, anything happens. The horse jumps sideways, and he jumps in the direction of the thing that doesn't scare him, and that is you, and that is why people end up wearing horses as ornaments on their bonnet. If horses were scared of cars, no one would ever hit them. And that is the problem. The biggest issue at the moment, I suppose, on the roads is electric cars, because the horse doesn't hear them coming, uh, or cyclists. So... I've seen videos before of us just to, like a horse riding along the road. It's all under control. Cars are behind it. It's all absolutely fine. And then a cyclist comes around the corner in front, coat flapping, all the rest of it. Horse goes, whoa, what the hell? Turn, spooks, run straight into traffic, crunch, bone, wallop all over people's bonnets and all the rest of it. All right. Um, so oh, give them a wide berth. Now, additionally, you also have to take into account that most horse riders will know that you are there and they will often move their horse into the middle of the road to stop you from going past. 
Now this could be for a good reason because they're sat up high, of course, so they can look over the fence or the hedge that's coming. There could well be a car coming the other way that you're unaware of. So they're deliberately blocking you until they can safely pull to the side to allow you past. So don't get annoyed. They have a better understanding of the situation than you do because you're closeted inside your car. Additionally, it is far easier for a horse to walk past a stationary car than it is to get a car past a stationary horse. Now, whenever we try to uh, park up my horse, um, he will put it by the side of the road to create room for a car to go past. And unless there happens to be something edible in that bush, he will go, Whoa, why have we stopped? And he'll turn round. Now, Boris, that's my horse, don't, it's not after the Prime Minister, all right? We named him before Boris got into power. So Boris is enormous, all right? He is longer than two cars parked side by side. So if you are in a country lane and this big fat horse starts to turn in the middle of the road, he takes up the entire road. If I keep him walking though, then he only takes up the width of a horse. So, if a car stops and a horse walks past the car, then everything stays narrow. And if we stop the horse, we can't guarantee that he's not going to suddenly turn around and rotate his bum into the middle of the road. Because of the greatest will in the world, a little person sat on top of a horse. If a horse wants to turn around, there's very little that the rider on top can do. Additionally, I can't think of a mode of transport that has real world lower priority than a car driver because if you were riding your driving your car and there's a cyclist in the road that's a vulnerable road user you're supposed to look after them the onus is on you pedestrian in the road in the road they get priority horses get priority motorcyclists are the same level as a car but they're vulnerable so that you have a greater care of duty you want to take on a lorry or a combine harvester be my guest. If I was in a country lane and I suddenly meet a lorry, I'm the one that's reversing. So basically the car driver, although they generally think they are superior on the road and that they own the planet, they are the lowest of the low. I can't think of anything lower than a car. Car has to give way to everything. You know, in the countryside, whatever you come across, the responsibility is on the car to get out of the way. So never forget that you have chosen to bring the lowest level vehicle that you can. Um, so don't suddenly think that everybody starts to, has to jump out of the way for you. You brought the wrong vehicle, mate. Turn up on a horse if you want to get a priority, all right? Also, additionally, a lot of people get upset that horses are even riding in the road. But the vast majority of the land surrounding uh, stables uh, is privately owned and we're not allowed on it. So we have to travel to a place to then go for a ride. Uh, and it's often easier to get there. Like, I mean, you might decide to go and play squash. So you take all your squash kit and you go to a place and you drive there and then you go and play squash. Well, we take our horse to the fields where we're allowed to ride, but we've got to get there first and we can't just fold them up and stick them in a bag and put them over our shoulder. Um, it's easier to ride them. So we have to get there. So we would much rather that we have access to all the fields and we don't want to ride in the road at all because we don't want to have conflict with other car drivers. Um, but, you know, there's nothing we can do. Uh, it is a hobby, it's a sport, a recreation, it's uh, equine therapy, it's all sorts of stuff. Think about the fact that they will try to help you as much as they can, but they're just entitled to be there as much as you are. So be careful. So you're coming across a bike. I was once told by one of my students, who is a mammal, middle-aged man in lycra, mammal, that the bicycle often gets hit by the second car or second vehicle. Right? Now, and I thought, what? <laughs> All right, but this is why. It's to do with the airflow, right? So, as you have something going through if you pick something like slab sided like a, a transit van or maybe a range rover something vertical well actually just take something that's aerodynamic 
Right, so you've got something aerodynamic. The air will hit that and it will flow over the top and over. Make it vertical like that. The air hits it and it doesn't go up necessarily. It sort of tends to spill sideways. So it goes poof, like this. So if you've got a bike like that and a car goes past at close proximity like this, the wind comes off the van and blows the cyclist to the left. So the cyclist leans to the right to stay upright. But then as the van goes past, the air, of course, rushes in behind. So the bike gets sucked because he's leaning to the right and he gets sucked into the path of the second car. And then the second car clicks him and spins him off. That is the issue that we've got here. Now, a bicycle, if you think about how tall a bicycle is, uh, they are taller than the width of a car. So if they crashed and wiped out and went all over the floor, they're going to basically take up the left-hand lane. So we don't know when this bike's going to wipe out. And if he does wipe out, he's going to take up a lot of room. So because he's suffering from our wind, we don't want anybody suffering from your wind. If you've got a bicycle, you keep the speed down. And my recommendation is no more than 10 or 15 mile an hour faster than the speed they are currently traveling. And that applies, of course, if they are in a cycle path. So if there's room to get past a bike and you can put them into a virtual cycle path, then just keep it slow as you go past. And once you're clear of them, then carry on building your speed. But ideally, we actually want to get to the other side of the road. So if I can just leave them the entire width of a car, then you can basically go past any speed you like. This is where you've got to weigh up the pros and cons. If you've only got a couple of cars coming the other way, and for the sake of two cars, for instance, coming the other way, and then you can go for the overtake and go to the other side, I would wait. If, however, it's rush hour and you've got a never ending stream of cars coming at you, if there is room to get past, then by all means squeeze past, but keep it slow. Because if he hits something and wipes out, then ideally he could put a hand on our roof and try and keep himself up. Or at least we can stop suddenly if he's wiping out. I did see this old boy once in Crowthorn. He was on his bike. He must have been in his 80s or something. He's just cycling slowly. And weirdly, he hit a full, full can of Coke, which sent him over the handlebars. And he smashed his face into the floor. And then we had to all park the car up and peel him out. And he was like legs through the frame and all sorts of stuff. And some woman kindly took him to hospital and looked after him. That sort of thing can happen like that. Just boom. Everything's fine, and then all of a sudden nothing's fine, you know? And we don't know when that's going to happen, so therefore you just drive accordingly, give them room because we don't know if they're going to wipe out, or keep it slow as we're going past. Helping others. If someone is overtaking you, let them. All right. The place where you're going to get this the most is in speed limit increases. I know myself when I've had powerful cars, the best place to do an overtake is to out accelerate the car that you're stuck behind. So if I say go from a 13 to a 50, if I can get to 50 before they can, I don't have to break any speed limits. I can be past them back in and I've taken them, right? So therefore, an increase in speed limit is a classic place for you to be overtaken because people will see the L plate on the roof and then they'll try to blow your doors off. So don't just get to that speed limit and then go boom, floor it, because if this bloke's overtaking you, he's supposed to come back and you accelerate with him. He's now stuck out here in the lane, right? Now, we've got to be mindful of this. 
So if somebody's overtaking you, you'll get this a lot as you get off um, Queen's Roundabout heading towards Aldershot, because there's that blooming 30 mile an hour section, then 50, then 60, so you've got two increase in speed limits. And then if you went down the slip road and turned right towards Fleet, you got a 40, then back into a 60. So you've got multiple places where people will be going for overtakes on you. But because nobody abides by the speed limit, we'll be stuck in that 30 getting off Queen's and everybody else is going past you. Then you get to the 50, you start to build your speed. So if somebody's coming past you, just accelerate slightly less than them so they can get back in. You could always then do a lane change to the other lane and then go for the overtake after that. But we don't want to keep them hung out there on the right hand side especially if it's a motorbike, we don't want to then accelerate and leave somebody in the path of oncoming traffic, like when you're heading on the road towards Fleet around the back of the airfield there. Because the longer they take to overtake, the more chance there is that they'll be in a car crash and then we get caught up in their car crash and then we have to deal with all that sort of stuff. So do consider if you are being overtaken, them, let them go and then go after them afterwards and then overtake them if you want to. But don't accelerate with them, all right? Uh, and then you could also consider, like, if you're on holiday, you know, um, like I've been on holiday driving roads, I'm driving around, my wife sat there going, now look at that. She doesn't talk like that. But she'll be going, oh, look at that, Gav. And I'll be thinking to myself, well, okay, fine. And I'm just driving around, looking at the scenery, admiring it, because I'm on holiday and I'm not in any rush. But everybody else that lives here, um, you know, they've seen that 400 times. So they just want to get to work. So you might want to consider periodically just pulling over and letting them go. Or if you're dawdling along, as soon as cars start to appear behind you, then uh, you know, build your speed. Don't hold people up. All right. Be considerate. And here's something that you might want to consider. You don't have to, there's nothing written down. It's just something that I've done before. Uh, maybe like I'm following a tractor, right? And then we're getting near a crest of a hill. We've been stuck behind him for ages and we're getting near a crest of a hill. I get, he comes over the top. I can see that it's safe. I go for the overtake. And what I've done before, it's just stayed in the right hand lane because that tells everybody behind the tractor that there's no oncoming traffic. And then I go back to the left when a car starts to turn up. Uh, which means more people behind get, you know, basically they are alerted to the fact there's no oncoming traffic, so more people can go to the overtake. Obviously, I mean, that's just me being a pinnacle of society, uh, being a shining example to us all, helping everybody out, but you don't have to do that. That's absolutely fine. Consider other people's routes. So, for instance, white car, in all instances, might be thinking of overtaking blue, but blue will have to consider, or you'll have to consider that blue might need to contend with other people. So think about where they are going to go. For instance, on a motorway, I could be in lane one, the left-hand lane, catching a car, and that car could be itself catching a car. So I need to look to see what the car in front of me is doing, because if he's just about to go for an overtake, then I might actually decide to do two overtakes. So I'll do two lane changes to allow him to do his overtake and I overtake both of them at the same time and back to the left. If I was coming up to something dodgy, you might decide, like you was a junction coming up, you might decide to uh, just defer, just wait 30 seconds and go for the overtake after that once you're past it right but don't feel as though don't just focus on this one thing in front of you think about the bigger picture are you being overtaken are they just about to overtake does that vehicle over there look like he's going to pull into the path all that sort of stuff it's got overtaking a stream of vehicles in here don't know if you can read that anyway he's a thingy me jiggy let's say you're following a lorry Right, so that's supposed to be the wheels, right? What can often happen is you're stuck behind a lorry, you don't know what's going on. Is it that you've got a slow lorry, or is it the fact that the lorry itself is stuck behind 30 cars? You know, you don't know sometimes. 
So what you can do is you can position your car left and right to try and see around them. Right, so you see, so the vehicle is moving to the side there to see around there. You're thinking about shadows, looking for cars, and then he's moving to the other side to see what's coming on. Try and see what's in front of that. And if you think about what's actually happening, you've got a lorry going up a hill. As they go over the hill, you can actually temporarily see underneath the lorry. You saw that? So you saw my eyes. Just as the lorry come over the top, you can't see anything. The lorry goes over, you can see what's behind him, and then he goes down the other side. And as they come over, you can actually look underneath the vehicle and see what's in front of them. Because is it just the lorry that you're overtaking, or is it a case of, oh, forget it, you've got no chance of overtaking? All right. Overtaking on corners. Well, the simple answer to this one is don't. Right hand bends. Now, this picture here is wrong, so I've had to update it. As you can see, the white car, you actually should position yourself on the inside of the corner. So the white car needs to actually come across a little bit. And what that enables them to do is actually look in front of the lorry. If you can see that, mm. yeah, you can see a little bit in better than what they had anyway. So you can see in front, and then what happens is we come to the side, we can see down here, pointy right. So this car coming across means I can see into this little section, this dark bit here, I can see into there, uh, and then you move across to the left. And what that happens is you can start to see further around the corner. Because you move to the outside of the corner, you can see further around it, okay? Now, as I was mentioning earlier on about the white lines in the middle of the road, you would normally have uh, solid white lines running up the middle, and then you could actually see if these were broken. And depending upon the extent of the break, you could then see that there's nothing coming and then go for the immediate overtake. That's what they're saying, all right? So you come in on the inside of the corner to look down in front of the lorry, then you move across to look round the corner, checking to see what the white lines are doing. You might even go down a gear to get those power up, you get the revs up, and then you pow, go, get on, get on with it before the car behind you blows your doors off, all right? Now, overtaking on a left. La la la, right. So this time they did actually draw it correctly, strangely. So they've come in on the inside of the corner here and then moved across to the outside there. So they've gone from the inside to the outside, which is what I said you should do here, right? Just to prove that I'm not talking twaddle. But what this picture has enabled us to do, the white car is able to see the blue car. And as he moves across, he can see that there's nothing following the blue car. Fine. And then he's thinking, right, well, I've got, I've, you know, broken white lines. I'm able to overtake that sort of thing. But there's a moment when this car goes behind the lorry where he won't be able to see what's coming the other way. Uh, we can be pretty sure as we go across that there is nothing coming down the road. But I've drawn in here, I don't know if you can see that, a little bit of a side road. So if you're going past a property, a field or anything like that, there's going to be a moment as you go behind a lorry that you can't see what's coming. You can be pretty damn sure there's nothing on the road, but there's, don't, we don't know if anything's going to join from the side. So you've got 98% happy, but there's always that 2% and I'm just thinking, yeah, but has anything joined? No, fine, go for the overtake. All right, so just be mindful. Then sometimes you can actually get this situation where you've got three lanes. Uh, if there's anything in the middle that is blocking your view, then do not use that middle lane. You will often get this situation where you've got a steep uphill. I mentioned crawler lanes earlier on. So you've got a left-hand lane for lorries that are travelling slowly. Everybody else barrels up the middle. But sometimes, especially down in Devon, there's this, like, if we go past, I think it's Devon. I'm rubbish at geography. 
as you go past Stonehenge heading off in that direction, there's the main road is basically just a single single carriageway with some dual carriageway bits. But then we share the middle lane. So what happens is everybody gets stuck behind a caravan and then you get to these three lanes and everybody goes whopping down the middle. But there's this one particular section <laughs> where the road looks like this, but the police have gone and put speed cameras down the whole thing, which is nice. So people just come out, overtake this caravan that they've been stuck behind for 15 miles and all get speeding tickets. Lovely. Mm. So do be mindful of that. All right. Uh, but if you can't see, do not go in there. That is just death waiting to happen. All right. So don't do it. Let's not go there. Right. Now, this little diagram, they were saying to us, beware of lurkers. Right. So white cars driving along, he's overtaking. And they're saying, be wary of this red car that might suddenly poke his nose out. I don't know what you're supposed to do with that piece of information. If uh, a car suddenly pulls out in front of you, um, um, bend over, kiss your ass goodbye. I don't know. You know, hit the horn. Oof. You're a bit kiboshed, frankly. So just be careful. I'm probably bouncing on the horn. Just be wary that somebody might suddenly poke out. We'll take an opportunity to look at this diagram, actually. Uh, I don't know if you see it. But where the red car is, the white line goes off at that, as his view goes off at a funny angle, goes off quite. So, all right. so where the red car is, the sight goes off like that. But actually just going back a little bit to the green, you can actually see down to there. So it actually goes to show that you don't actually have to be that far back to get quite a massive improvement in vision. All right, just food for thought. Match the speed. So if you're sitting on somebody's shoulder, doing the overtaking triangle. Oh, overtaking triangles, forgot that bit. No, I haven't, I haven't. I mentioned it, overtaking triangle. I just forgot to mention the overtaking triangle part. So uh, sit off their shoulder, pick a reserve gear, so you get ready to go out power, uh, or take a run up and blow their doors off if you get a really good view. Mention that. Take a smooth line, don't cut back in. How can you warn a driver ahead of your intent to overtake? You could, what the police do is they flash their lights. Because um, what it does is it alerts people to go like that and then they'll see you overtaking. Just one, you know, just so everybody goes, what's that? And they'll see you overtaking. You could do that at night time. Mentioned about going down a gear. So there we go. So that's your considerations regarding overtaking. If in doubt, chicken out. Get the car into a good state to go. Uh, we've mentioned about bikes, animals, passing on the left, lane changing, helping others and overtaking. Jobs are good and hopefully that's useful to you. Uh, just consider all of that. Um, if there's more, I'll add it at a later date, but hopefully that helps. Stay safe.